Maizeliness. Allah Almighty says, But as for him who is stingy and self-satisfied and denies the good, we will pave his way to difficulty. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of Purification of the Soul. I'm your host Abu Abdus Salam and we have with us in the studio our guests Karim, Muhammad and Gurras. In this series we're discussing purification of the soul or tazkiyatun nufus and we mentioned that the word tazkiyah in Arabic has two connotations uh, to it. What are those connotations? The linguistic meaning I think is to purify or cleanse and to increase to purify oneself from what? Purify oneself of the bad qualities and characteristics. And then increase in? The good qualities. Good qualities. And this is what Tazkiyat al nafus is all about. And we spoke about the soul, the nafs or the ruh. And we said that it is one of three components that when they come together, they join together to create or to come to bring a creation by the name of insan or man. What are these three components? First and foremost is the ruh, the spirit. The spirit, the body, the, the body, and the intellect. And the intellect, the aql. And also, we said in the first episode about how the three components of Islam, or of the deen, of the religion, uh, are related to these three components of man. What, how, how is that? The three parts of the deen, Islam. So, for instance, you could say the bed and the body is related to uh, Islam. Which are the outer actions. In this case, it's uh-huh, the body. And then, then Iman. Iman, which is? It's related to the, to the aql and the beliefs. Intellect, yeah, which is to do with the belief system. And the ruh, the spirit, which is related to ihsan. Ihsan, or the outer, or the uh, spiritual perfection, if you like. That's right. And one of the diseases that we're now going to be looking at... Uh, a very important disease that we should remove ourselves from. And it's a continuation from what we were talking about in the last episode. Uh, in the last episode, we were talking about love of this world. And we now come to realize, after studying that, is that love of this world often leads to this disease, which is called miserliness or stinginess. In Arabic, bukhul. Now, Jabir ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Beware of oppression, for oppression will be darkness on the Day of Judgment. And beware of miserliness, stinginess, because it destroyed those who were before you. It incited them to shed their blood and deemed the unlawful as lawful. Now, as we know, miserliness is a quality that no one likes having attributed to them. And it's to refuse to give something that one has acquired to someone who has requested it. And it is far worse, as Ibn Hajjah said, when the one who requests it is entitled to that thing. And even worse than that is when someone is miserly with someone else's property. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala censures in the Quran those who are stingy and order the people to be stingy in Surah An-Nisa, verse number 37. Now, why in Islam, why is miserliness so detested? Why is it something considered not good? Stinginess. Such, and such a quality is uh, very much con- contrary to the, to the brotherhood and, the, and, and generosity which are praiseworthy things within Islam. How can we see some of this generosity uh, and brotherhood uh, in, at the time of the Sahaba, in particular after Hijrah, um, while they were making Hijrah? In hospitality and the muakhab in between al-muhajirin and al-ansar. Which means in English? Which means uh, brotherhood. brotherhood between Muhajirin, those who immigrated from Mecca to Al Madina, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, those uh, the Ansar, the, the Ansar, helpers. those who supported uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, what kind of things did the Ansar do, for example, those who were in Medina? What did they do to help those who had emigrated from Mecca to show this brotherhood? That's what they accommodated them within the houses. They offered. Them, you know, half the, the, their wealth, half their wealth, you know, to, even to the extent that they were willing to, you know, offer one of their wives to them. Mm. 
What else? In terms of wealth, the wealth that they had, they would divide it and they would offer it to the Muhajirin. Muhajirin. And there was a kind of true brotherhood. So, miserliness, as you mentioned, is something that is contrary to the Islamic spirit of this brotherhood. Innamal mu'minuna ikhwa. That the believers are but brothers. And this is something uh, that we need to concentrate more on when we talk about loving each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about how we should not hate each other. Muslims should not hate each other. And we'll talk about that in future episodes insha'Allah. But there are two main aspects of miserliness in Islam. The first aspect is against the sharia of Islam. And the second aspect is contrary to, if you like, meritorious character. Uh, one can be a miser with respect to the sharia if he withholds from paying zakah or from supporting one's dependents or something like this. In other words, if a person withholds from any obligatory type of spending is in Islam, then he's considered to be a miser according to the sharia. And this is haram. And it is necessary for the person to cure himself of this kind of stinginess, miserliness, niggardliness. Um, so this is the first aspect, against the sharia. You can sum this up by saying anything that a person is obliged to spend his wealth on, and he doesn't do it, then he's considered to be stingy in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, in the sharia, in the, in the law of Islam. The second aspect with regards to uh, miserliness is in accordance uh, with a meritorious character. In other words, it's just part of good character, part of uh, brotherhood, if you like. Um, that is, a person, he'd be considered a miser among the people if he lacks virtuous merit. When someone comes to him, um, he refuses, even though he has the money. So, uh, one, an example could be where there's a poverty-stricken beggar, you know, one who really desperately needs a small amount of money. The person has the money in his pocket, for example. And perhaps he's only looking for a small amount of money, something to just buy him food for the day. The person has the money in his pocket. He has no need of that money. It's extra, fadal, what they call in Arabic. It's extra. But the person refuses to give that money, even though he's able to do so. Another example is to give a hard time to someone who owes you a small amount of money. You, you, for example, you gave them a loan of a small amount of money that you really don't have specific need of at that time. You can wait a year, two years, three years. There's no way you're going to need that money. You have much more. But then you're miserly because you go after that person. You give them a hard time. And so on and so forth. And this is to do with one's character, his maru'ah, if you like. And so the one who doesn't have this, he's fallen into what is known as the khawarimul maru'ah, those things which make a person's character uh, bad. Um, and Ali radiallahu anhu said that the rich miser is poorer than the generous poor person. What, why is this the case? Why would a person who's rich but he's stingy? in reality be poorer, poorer than the one who's poor, but he's generous. No, it's like he cannot feel the existence of money in his hands. He just cannot spend them, he just cannot feel that he has money like, like a rich man. He, he's more suffering than the poor, because he, he has money but he suffers from poverty. Because he's not willing to spend that money. Exactly. He's hoarding it up, it's in his bank, um, and maybe even getting interest, which is haram. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He wages war against those who uh, deal with riba, uh, interest. And unfortunately, some people, especially in the Muslim lands, they deal with interest with different names. They don't call it riba, they call it fawaid or riba, profit or benefit. So they take interest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala waged war against those who deal in, 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 in riba, in interest. Now, the point here, as you mentioned, he's poor, the rich person who, is, who has a lot of money, but he simply, he's, he's miserly with that money, he's living a pauper's life. It doesn't, he doesn't have any kind of feeling towards that wealth, simply because he doesn't spend it. He doesn't see the benefits, if you like, of that wealth. Why else would he be poorer? 
perhaps um, in the in the uh, in the akhirah because he has the ability to spend if you will uh, yeah, in that's the cause one, of Allah. that's a good uh, that's a good explanation another one also by not spending he doesn't experience the the joy and yeah that's spending. what that's what Karim was mentioning yeah. but in terms of being spiritually poor yeah. a person may have a lot of money but he might be spiritually poor he had a resource, a material resource that he could exploit in the obedience of Allah, but he didn't make any use of it. He didn't make use of it. And this is why Ali radiallahu anhu said, as we said, that the rich miser is poorer than the generous poor person. He's mentally poor. He has this psyche that he simply cannot give. Just like the poor person, physically he cannot give. But this person, he has this psyche that even though he has the money, he has this psyche that he cannot give. And you see many people who may even be wealthy, but when something is being, given, being given, given out free, they're the first to seek it. They're the first in the queue. Even if it's meant for poor people, they'll be the first to accept. They'll be the first to put their hands out. But when they are asked for something that, uh, that even may be spare to them, they refuse to give it. And this, is, this attitude is totally contrary to the Islamic practice of generosity. And inshallah, we'll, we'll touch more about this issue of generosity and how the Prophet ﷺ himself was so generous after this break, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum. Insha'Allah on the straight path, we would like to discuss the niqab from an Islamic and social political perspective. So sometimes, some non-Muslims, they might not understand the full Islamic pictures. Anyone can say anything about it. Yes. So when can we, who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. This is the biggest question. <laughs> who speaks for Islam? Mm -hmm. No, they are not sinning. They are not sinning, but we are talking about now the general ruling. Mm -hmm. They are not sinning, but they are going against what has been established. It is his own ijtihad at a specific time. People would see it as a um, threat. A threat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we explain to them it's not really a threat? It's a actually good for the country as well. But if we don't participate, how would we ever reach to our rights? Can you clarify with us what should be the level of political participation of the Muslims in the West? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We were speaking before the break about the quality of miserliness. And we said that in Arabic the word is bukhal, uh, or stinginess, niggardliness. And we said that this is a very bad quality. We mentioned that there are some people that even though they may be affluent and rich, sometimes uh, when something is being given out free, they'll be the first in the queue to accept such gifts. Um, and likewise, on the, uh, controversially, if conversely, when they are asked for something that may even be spared to them, they refuse to give it. Anything, any small thing, even if somebody wants to borrow something from them, they refuse to give it. Now this attitude is totally contrary to the Islamic practice of generosity. The Prophet ﷺ was extremely generous. And Ibn Abbas, عنهما, if I remember correctly, he said, that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَجْوَدَ النَّاسِ The Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of people. The most generous of people. In fact, Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, when he was speaking about the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ, he said that in Ramadan, he was like a rih al-mursala, the whirlwind, whirlwind, the strong whirlwind. In other words, he could not think of a word. The narrator of this hadith could not think of a word sufficient enough, uh, which was sufficient enough to describe the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ in Ramadan. He simply said it was like a whirlwind due to the tremendous generosity that he displayed. In another narration, Jabir anhu said that the Prophet ﷺ was never asked for anything and he said no. Imagine that quality. You ask Anything from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he never refuses. 
And this was the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, there are many causes for stinginess, miserliness. Let's have some examples of that. Why, what would make somebody uh, have this trait of stinginess? One that comes to mind is uh, perhaps the person is insecure. And because... What do you mean by that? For instance, he may have accumulated a large amount of wealth. Uh-huh. But he feels that if he was to spend or give it away in charity, etc., etc., he would lose it, and all of it would go. Yeah. So he maybe he doesn't have enough reliance of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And in one of the episodes previously, we mentioned about how reliance of Allah subhanahu wa taala stops miserliness. Because if a person uh, has trust in Allah, that Allah is the one who provides, then he'll be willing to give away his wealth as and when he uh, feels the need to. I guess that goes back to the. The fact that man has, you know, infinite wants, that when he has something, he he always wants some more. It was, uh, I think the Prophet also mentioned if he has a mountain of gold, he want two mountains. Uh, go yeah. back to the point of reliance on Allah. If someone has reliance on Allah, he, he he feels secure. But if one doesn't have such faith, he feels secure with money. It gives him sort of social and financial security. So he's always afraid of losing his money because this means he will be poor and suffers poverty and lack of money and hunger and But why would he why doesn't he lend other people things? Why refuse to do minor little things like that? I suppose you could say that he doesn't want to lose perhaps his position over others. How how would that for instance be the case? Uh, for an example you could say he may have a laptop, one mm -hmm. of the latest laptops, and another person may want a laptop that is similar to that or even better than that. Mm -hmm. So instead of lending him his laptop or giving him the money to purchase it, he may just say, he may give him a small amount of money to purchase something, uh, uh, a laptop which is of a lower specification than his one because he wants to maintain. So that kind of goes against the love for your brother, what you love for yourself exactly. uh, aspect. Maybe he fears also that if he lends somebody his, thing, uh, you know, his, his things, then that they may damage it or not look after it. Like, I don't know. You know, maybe they have some, some item of clothing that they want. They and this relates to the yeah. trust as well, the trust in, in your brother, which again, the person who is, who is, is, who is a miser, he will not have. What about, um, what is the essence of miserliness? What's the deep-rooted reason for miserliness? I think it's uh, the materialistic behavior you know, and trend of society. Everything you can get, anything you need for money. So, money means everything. Means security. Means luxury. Means so, means everything. Means re people's respect. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's the love of the dunya, isn't it? Really? What, yes, the love of the dunya, the love of this world, the extreme attachment uh, to this world. We'll pick up on that point after looking at some comments made by some of the uh, people that were interviewed earlier. They say that uh, the person would be miserable by the lack of his soul since uh, life is not only what uh, the blood that runs in someone's vein or the oxygen that comes to the lungs. It is the faith that someone has in God or the faith in life, love and uh, the love that he can share with people around him. By, the, by that only, by company and friendship, misery would uh, be less. The rich miser could be apparently uh, so rich and do whatever he wants and the poor person is poor he doesn't have any money but, I'm, but on the other side of course the rich miser is much much poorer than the poor guy because the poor guy could be working could be like do, do anything that could make him richer with money and richer with friends and all the things that are more, much more important than the money the rich, the rich miser is a miser. He doesn't actually use his, his, his money. So he couldn't be uh, rich. His richness, his richness couldn't be uh, like, uh, any useful to him. I think that uh, this is very dangerous for the society and for social solidarity between the members of society because I think the gap between the rich and the poor is going to be increased and, uh, and this will cause an instability. Some interesting comments made there. Now, we're talking about some of the causes of miserliness. What Sorry, I just have to, just to interrupt you, Sheikh. I'm a bit confused. Can one be a miser in terms of wealth only? 
Is it specific to wealth? There are other types of miserliness as well. As we mentioned, miserliness is something that can be done against the Sharia, withholding wealth. It can be d- something done against humanity, losing uh, character, if you like. But there are other types of miserliness, like a person who has knowledge. A person who has knowledge, and he doesn't give that knowledge, he can be considered to be a miser. How is that the case? Because, um, you know, just keeping that knowledge to himself is not sharing it with the people. So he's being stingy. Sometimes this can be worse. Yeah, because he's trying to keep the superior infer- inferior re- relationship with others. That's one possibility. That's one possible reason why he's being stingy with regards to his knowledge. But you can also say that he doesn't want to share his knowledge out of fear of his intention being compromised. Ostentation. But what's the remedy for that? Should he, like if a person prays and he is ostentatious, he shouldn't stop praying. He should rather cure the ostentation. So he should give out the knowledge or give zakat for his knowledge. But when there are many cases of companions who would, who would not, who would not po- give the knowledge and pass it on to other companions to you know, answer questions. When there is a sufficient number of people present, then it's okay for you to do that. It's okay for you to pass it on, and that's often safer. The safer, but when there is not uh, enough uh, people to give out this sacred knowledge, knowledge of Islam and the Deen, then this is something that is uh, is praiseworthy for a person to give out the knowledge, on the condition that, of course, he has to be uh, free or try to avoid any kind of showing off or ostentation. In terms of worldly knowledge, you were making a point about superiority. Yeah, when someone is superior in a certain field, he doesn't want anyone to be a competitor for him. So he's trying to keep back the, 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 his knowledge for himself and doesn't try to share it with others. I remember a, a statement that it was like a joke as a such, but it has great morals to it where a person who is a teacher of like... Uh, some kind of self-defense, karate, taekwondo, whatever. And he had a student. And he taught the student almost everything that he knew. Until the student came to a certain level. And he said, okay, teacher, let me, let's, let's have a fight. Because now I know everything. I'm going to beat you in this fight. And the teacher, he said, okay. So he pulled out a new maneuver, a new move that he hadn't taught his student. And he beat him with that move. So the student, he said, uh, hey, you didn't teach me that. He said, yes, I saved it for this day. <laughs> he saved, I saved that move for this day. So sometimes knowledge can, and obviously the moral behind that is knowledge can lead to a person to having pride or arrogance, uh, not respecting their teachers and so on and so forth. But that's not really an excuse to be miserly with one's knowledge. But coming back to the point of the, um, of the causes of miserliness, you have causes that are, you know, things like a person, uh, we, we have different types of causes, but what is the root cause of miserliness? Love of this world. Love of this world. If a person can cure that and have reliance and tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he can cure his miserliness. This is the root cause of this. What about the effects of miserliness on society, on individuals, on family, on friendships? I mean, I guess it causes, you know, hatred and you know, distrust between people. That you know, why is he not giving, you know, sharing his things with me? Does he not like me? Doesn't he trust me? Doesn't, Doesn't he, trust he think me? I'll give the money back? I suppose it can thing. lead to the economic downfall of uh, societies as well, because if people refuse and they don't want to spend, then trade will not occur. And, you know, and, and, and perhaps certain public interests, nobody would spend towards it. If everybody, imagine a society where everybody is, is a miser. Nobody would build bridges, for example, if in an Islamic state people would give money towards these kind of public interests. Nobody would build masajid, mosques, schools and these kind of things, unless there's a personal benefit in it for themselves. There will be no society because everyone is living for himself and by himself. He mm. doesn't want to share anything with others, especially the material interest. I think this, such a person also, it shows his, uh, maybe his arrogance in that he believes you know, the, the blessings that Allah has given him. 
yeah. he's deserving for himself only. It's, it's yeah. not something. It's something that belongs to him, so he doesn't wish he to doesn't share. He doesn't realize it. that the blessings that Allah Taala has given him are temporary, and they belong to Allah Subhanahu Taala. Allah is the one who, who blessed. And also, the person will be asked about the wealth, the blessings that Allah Subhanahu Taala has bestowed uh, on him. Some of the effects of miserliness we can see. We mentioned some of them uh, with regards to the uh, society. the society, the individual. Um, what about on friendships, for example? It would lead to friendships being uh, destroyed. I because think. part of friendship is to give as well as take, not just take. It's give and take. And that goes with married life, for example. It goes with family and so on and so forth, inshallah. In the next episode, we'll talk about some of the cures uh, for miserliness. And we'll go and we'll see, inshallah, some examples of generosity that was displayed uh, by the companions to each other. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.